Yeah, I think we can kick off whenever you want, Tanya. Great. Um, well, <laughs> um, hello, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Tanya Riley, and I'm a privacy and cybersecurity reporter with CyberScoop, um, and I'll be your moderator today. So, a little over a month ago, President Biden signed a first of its kind executive order aimed at improving federal cybersecurity. Um, maybe some of my panelists will disagree with first of its kind, but that's what we're going with for now. Um, this order is meant to instill more rigorous cybersecurity practices for software providers that contract with the federal government um, and also require federal agencies to adopt um, better security practices, including zero trust architecture. And we'll get into a few of these other requirements during the panel. Now that this order has been passed, we find ourselves with a familiar question in Washington. What happens next? How do we move from policy to implementation? The Biden administration has set an ambitious timeline for many of these changes, but how are they gonna play out in the real world and with industry? Here to discuss these questions with us today are our panelists. Um, first, we have Alan Freeman. If you could just wave your hand um, so people can connect faces with name. Names, Alan Freeman, Director of Cybersecurity Initiatives for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration at the Department of Commerce. We also have Camille Stewart, Global Head of Product Security at Google and a Cyber Fellow at the Harvard Belfer Center. Also from Google, we have Jeanette Malfra, Director of Risk and Compliance at Google Cloud and former Assistant Director for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency at the Department of Homeland Security. Finally, we have Bryson Bort, an R Street Institute Senior Fellow and founder and CEO of Scythe. Thank you all for joining us today. So let's start with the basics here. With this executive order, what's at stake in terms of how it plays out and what have we seen so far in terms of progress? Anyone wanna start? Alan, I feel like you should start because for years you have been trying to drop the S-bomb and someone finally primed it. Well, uh, so first, I uh, think the, the executive order covers uh, a lot of ground. It has some really interesting ideas that have been in the research community and the cybersecurity community for a while, including a sort of cyber NTSB uh, that will allow some incident reviews, uh, lots of renewed emphasis and push on driving federal uh, government to the cloud. Um, I've been spending most of my time focused on section four, which is about improving the supply chain for what the federal government does. Uh, and there's a lot in here. The good news is that a lot of what's talked about is fairly common sense ideas. Things like, do you have multi-factor your development environment? And can you show us that you're using static and dynamic testing tools and things like that? The challenge is not all of those common sense features easily map to standards or things that we can easily uh, understand. And so that's going to be a lot of the work moving forward. Uh, NIST has uh, led things off by saying, um, let's have a, a workshop to talk about this. The particular focus on a very tight deadline to define what critical systems means uh, for the federal government. Uh, and then of course, uh, one part, and the part that I've been focusing on, uh, some of you know, is the software bill of materials of the things that are listed uh, that are recommended for uh, what the government buys. Um, perhaps one of the newer uh, parts is software bill of materials, which is a list of ingredients for uh, software. And I'm happy to dive more into that. Uh, but the timelines, as, as you mentioned, are very tight. Um, and I think that's a signal that the administration is quite serious about moving forward. Uh, the pain has been shared. Uh, so those of us in the government have been given very tight timelines. Uh, we in turn have said, hey, we want industry feedback. We want community feedback, but we're also going to give you very tight timelines. So uh, NIST gave people about seven or eight days uh, for uh, their request for two page uh, papers. It's very hard to write a short paper uh, in a short length of time. Uh, and NTIA asked for feedback uh, in two weeks. So we, we've distributed uh, the sense of urgency across the community. That is definitely not a deadline I would want. <laughs> I guess, you know, going back to the private sector, um, does anyone have any, I know one of the questions that came up in our pre-panel discussion is how do we make sure that 
all these voices are being included and that there is that communication between the private and public sector. So sort of given uh, the implementation process and the feedback process is, you know, how are you guys reacting to that? I think Alan teed it up really well. I mean, companies are engaging in these quick turnaround requests for information. The Cyber Safety Board, as it's outlined, includes private sector participation. Chris Inglis was just confirmed by the Senate and his job is to engage the private sector and facilitate that as part of the cyber apparatus. And I anticipate that he will be very active in pulling um, the private sector perspective into the work that he starts to lead. So I, I think the private sector is mobilizing around making sure that their ideas on standards, that their ideas on what software and hardware supply chain security looks like are integrated into the conversation, how to make that sustainable. The safety board is mobilizing around uh, solar winds to articulate not only what happened, why, how, when, where for that incident, but how, board, how the board should look at those things moving forward. And so I think we have a lot of opportunities for private sector uh, to give voice to the, their perspective, but it is a hard proposition with seven, eight day turnarounds. I think um, what I can add is one back to one of your earliest points, Tanya, on um, the the precedence of the executive order for those folks who haven't been following cyber policy for a couple of decades. Um, I, I I would just like to point out that there has been a an, this is an evolution of um, policy that has largely stayed consistent through multiple administrations. So I think that's important to, to note for, for folks. And um, you know, personally, I was involved in Obama era executive orders, Trump era executive orders on the government side. So, um, uh, but honestly, you can stretch all the way back to the Clinton administration with some of these first concepts. Um, and so fundamentally, right, the public-private partnership needs to be very strong in order to be successful. That has always been a key principle, and, um, and, and I'm glad to see that continue. And, uh, and, and then leveraging um, standards and um, in, in the work that, that NIST does, but also broader industry standards and bringing those together. I think um, those are those sort of key principles that, um, that have, have always been in place, and, and I believe will continue continue to be in place for you know, what Alan just discussed. Um, so we as a company, as well as many others, are very involved. Um, you know, much of what we're doing is helping to um, explain how we have built some of this capability, whether that's zero trust, secure software supply chain, secure code development, all these things, how has Google done it internally, and then providing that um, for, um, for, for others for, for their consideration. And, and what that means for maybe, in, you know, what Alan was talking about building a, um, a secure software uh, supply chain ecosystem and, and what does that look like? How do you prove that out um, for folks who don't have the time to sit there and sift through all of the code? Um, how do you get that level of assurance in place? It's, you know, trust but verify. So, um, so we're very eager to continue to participate um, and continue to meet those, those deadlines. I think it's always a balance of, um, you know, trying to achieve consensus and getting everybody sort of on the same page versus, you know, at some point there is not going to be consensus. And so, you know, what I just sort of continue to urge my government colleagues and, and those in industry is we also need to make sure it's operationally relevant. And, and so continuing to get into those details, even when, when we don't agree, um, my sense is that's a good sign because that means we've hit on something that is, is worth digging into. And if there's standards missing, where do we need to engage with standards bodies to, to drive those standards forward? If there's challenges in an organization implementing that technically, what, what does that mean? What does that mean that's missing from, um, from industry? So. Overall, I think it's a great step forward. I'm glad to, that um, sort of those core principles are consistently carried forward. And I, and I really see this as like a, a great evolution of getting to that next level of specificity on a lot of these issues that have really challenged um, government and, and many private sector organizations for a long time as well. If I'm Jeanette, I gotta be a little jelly that this new organization finally gets an ally like Chris Inglis and there to, to help with these issues. Um, you know, where, where was that before? I mean, we know, but it's, it's, it's just kind of like, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, yeah, so uh, bringing it back. Um, one, uh, the, the information sharing piece, I think we've been hearing about how information sharing and public-private partnership should be happening for years. I mean, I, I feel like every, every, every three to six months, whenever something bad happens, everyone goes, well, we should do information sharing. And yet we don't, and we haven't. And so I'm really curious to see how information sharing becomes something that has more teeth. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how the cyber equivalent of the NTSB plays into that. Uh, we don't know security. I joke that there are no experts in the space. And a lot of that is that we have too many silos of information. And this isn't even tactically on, oh, this is the latest threat that I need to quickly have signature defenses against so much as we're not really having enough transparency for the best lessons learned in people, process, and technology to get rolled out there and to get pushed. Um, one that I'm particularly skeptical because they have called out some particular technologies in this is zero trust architecture. I have never seen zero trust architecture implemented effectively where it doesn't get in the way of the business operations. And I'm very interested to see how this is done at speed, at scale. Uh, you almost have to be going to the cloud adoption that's being pushed as well as a part of this to make it happen. But I feel like there's going to be a lot of stumbling blocks. And if I were to call the one long pole in the tent that I think is not going to get happen, that is not going to happen on time, it's going to be ZTA. Uh, the other one, um, which ties to my background, because I am the co-founder of the ICS Village, I do a lot of industrial control systems work, is that particular phrasing of critical systems immediately brings to mind critical infrastructure, industrial control systems, which industrial control systems are either directly or indirectly absolutely a part of the risk surface area and the potential impact to services for different federal agencies. Completely not addressed at all in this. So, I asked you. Oh, I'm sorry. I was I was going to jump on on something that both both Bryson and Jeanette said, which is the the, the challenge that when we're dealing with public policy, uh, is right this tension between uh, uniformity and flexibility. Uh, and so I'll, I'll give you an example from my little S bomb world, um, where a lot of the focus and the use cases of having of knowing what's in software is that well it's on my network. So I need to know what's in it so I can defend it because a patch may not be available, the company may go out of business. There are all sorts of reasons why I need to know it. It's my network, I need to defend it. That's not true for SaaS. Doesn't mean that there's no supply chain risk, but it's something that we need to understand what the use cases are going to look like and have to figure out is cloud software and software as a service and infrastructure as a service, are those going to have to be treated differently? And how do you build this model so that you can accommodate uh, the different technical platforms and operations, as well as the different business models, right? The way that ICS is bought and deployed is sort of the opposite end of our modern CI CD system, right? You have hourly builds versus I'm buying for 25 years. Uh, and, and sort of trying to navigate that tension requires some flexibility. The challenge with flexibility is flexibility increases cost and complexity of compliance. Uh, and so how do we manage this? And from a government perspective, how do we get industry used to the idea that if we're going to start slow, that's fine, but that's not a one and done approach. So if we're going to start slow next year, you will have to do more than you're doing this year uh, as we expand it. And, and we're going to need sort of industry to all of industry. We're just going to make Jeanette and Camille and Bryson just the synecdoche of industry right now. Uh, to, to sort of say, well, what this is going to look like for us? How do we build this into our existing models? Because it's going to require some changing on their part too. Before we talk any more about SBOM, throwing around a lot of acronyms here, Alan, maybe you can get a little bit more into what exactly that means. Um, and then we can talk about what kind of challenges adopting that poses for private companies. I'm not sure which of our long suffering panelists have heard me give my SBOM spiel more over the, the last few years. Uh, but so a software bill of materials is uh, essentially the slightly imperfect analogy is it's a list of ingredients for software. Modern software is not hewn out of alabaster by tonsured monks on Greek islands, as much fun as that would be. No, it's assembled. 
Uh, it's assembled out of different pieces in different layers, often open source. And many of these components are out of date, like an ingredients list. They could be rotten or stale or in the case of cybersecurity, actively compromised. Uh, and so software bills of material or SBOMs are the first step towards having greater transparency into our supply chain. Uh, it won't solve everything. There are lots of other ways that someone might want to attack the supply chain, going after the tools themselves, for example. But the very least we can say is, hey, what the components are. And one way to flip this around is to say, would, why would anyone buy from a organization, whether open source or use from an organization that didn't have the ability to say, these are my components and these are their dependencies and these are their dependencies. Because that's sort of what we think of as sort of doing the, the basic due diligence for software development. Mm -hmm. And Jeanette, um, what kind of challenges does that create for the private sector? Obviously technology is always evolving we're gonna have this ingredient list being sent to the government on the regular, you know, is, is that gonna be a difficult thing for companies of different sizes to do? Yeah, and I think um, to quote, represent the private sector, which is a very large, um, not homogenous group at all. Um, I would say first, um, I think really everybody would probably agree with the principles of transparency and due diligence that is needed um, to help make a dent in some of these challenges around um, uh, building a secure software supply chain. I think um, it, it does need to be done in a way that is easy for organizations to digest and, um, and, and do something with, but also you, you know, you, you do run the risk of um, an organization indexing or, or over indexing on a certain type of risk. If you say, okay, here's one through N of your sort of um, nutrition ingredient list. And, um, and, you know, maybe says, okay, well, I don't, I don't like this particular thing, or I don't like code developed in this country um, or by this company. Um, it, and it may, um, it, it may be challenging um, for, for organizations to potentially implement. I'm not, I'm not sort of suggesting that that would necessarily be the case, just to, um, for, for organizations to, to think about. Um, you know, we've had um, at Google long experience, um, you know, for our own interests, we obviously want to have a very secure um, uh, supply chain. And, and so we've, we've spent a lot of time thinking about it, something we call um, binary authorization. Um, and there's, there's a lot that you can read about it if, if you're interested in getting to the details, but, but really getting to where you've got technical controls in place, but that can be auditable in, in some way. And, um, and so I think that, that's sort of our perspective, um, but um, I, I completely agree that um, we need to have some mechanism that creates both an environment of transparency and um, in an ability for organizations to do their due diligence um, to, to be able to decide whether this software makes sense. There's just, there's a lot of evolution and maturity though that needs to happen in terms of an organization even being able to understand what their risk profile should be and what are their dependencies on software and what makes sense for criticality. I do believe that every organization foot should be in a position to do their own criticality assess assessment based off of their own risk posture. Um, but um, that, that is an area that a lot of organizations in the government and out, frankly, probably need to um, spend some time maturity. So any sort of maturing, any solution that can help provide that transparency and that guidance, um, I, I, think is, I think is useful, but we just have to be careful not to make it too prescriptive so that organizations um, are, are sort of limited in, in being able to adapt it to their own uh, risk profile. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump on that. So, I mean, this is, I, I say this a lot. We've known since the 1980s, the ITIL framework says configuration and change management. And I believe that configuration and change management combined are the two, the primary control processes to your infrastructure um, is 80% of, of all of this. I mean, asset identification, what do I got? Where is it? What's the state of it? And there we go. Um, I mean, Alan's idea with SBOM, well, I mean, SBOM, Alan, you, you, you get to be the spokesperson. I give you all the credit, but the, the SBOM idea was, of course, exposing that same kind of insight into software 
Um, and so the same process there, but now exposing the life cycle of that because there is risk and context to that modularity, just like we see in hardware, the same thing applies in software. Uh, but I think, again, going back to the timing on this, I see organizations of all sorts of shapes and sizes who have not figured out those basics of what do I have and what's that state. And the U.S. government is one of the worst offenders. And here they are with that fundamental challenge to how am I going to identify what are my critical systems when I don't even know what my systems are. Which also is your trust point too, as well, Bryson. Oh yeah, configuration management is critical for zero trust. Um, I I was talking with uh, somebody the other day who's working on a um, small zero trust implementation on a SAP program, and I was just like, yeah, I can see that where you are starting from a program from scratch, you are building the data types and the configuration management from scratch. You're going to deploy that. You're going to have challenges with that as you go from the academic into practice, and you're going to figure it out. And this could be a kind of thing, you know, where there's I don't know. 50 to 250 people in it. Now take that to the federal networks. Uh, I, I, again, I'm calling that one out is that's the long pole in the tent. It's not a tech problem. It's a, what do we got? What's the process? And there's just so much inertia that they have to overcome. And speaking of, you know, federal agencies putting these technologies into place, um, as Alan said, some. A lot of these are common sense ideas. Some of them are as simple as multi-factor authentication, which I assume many of our viewers have in place, uh, or at least know they should. Um, but then we have ideas like logging, which might be a little more complex. Are we asking too much too fast of these government agencies? Is this gonna blow up in our faces in terms of wanting all these things at once? Or how do you guys think about that? it'll blow up it just won't happen though i mean it's a lot to ingest all at once i think they'll have to pull some principles it'll depend on the environment looking at the cdm implementation and the environments of each agency and how intricate and detailed the planning had to be because each environment was so different and the, the uh, resourcing, both people resourcing and otherwise for each agency was so different um, that this is going to take a while. I mean, the mandate to have a definition for critical software, I also think is really ambitious and feeds back into some of this. Or, I mean, look how long it took us to define critical technologies. Look at how long it's taken us to think through, you know, some of these tangential issues if we can't align around the definition, some of these implementations will be a lot harder. So I think they'll pull principles and have to advance as much as they can, but I don't think uniform adoption is going to happen very quickly. So, uh, oh, oh, go ahead, Bryson. No, just jumping on what Camille said. I think that was a really good insight. This is not gonna be a monolithic, all the agencies just move forward. Um, I think that DOD and Intel is going to do better. And I think that FedCiv is going to be, be hurting for a while. Um, I also want to emphasize the, the taking down some of the gloom and doom is it's not that things are going to be broken. It's just they're not going to be quite at the level that I think everybody would like that this EO is pushing for. And so this is where the caveat is. I, of course, do not speak for anyone other than uh, myself and, and the SBOM work at the moment, but I'll, I'll sort of flag two things. First is to Camille's point about definitions and cut lines. Uh, those are going to be the, the function of you know, good policy making, but also a little bit of politics. Uh, and one of the challenges that we sometimes see <clears throat> is the community playing for time uh, and saying, well, let's spend our time arguing over some of the minutia here and here. And I think just looking at the, the, the timelines that have been laid out uh, in the EO, I think there's going to be less tolerance for that today. And so as, as the community starts to say, how are we going to mobilize and respond? Um, I think <clears throat> that strategy will probably not be as effective. The other thing I'll just offer, and this is a general observation, is um, US agencies are incredibly under-resourced. My, my colleagues that are on the operations side of the house are incredibly under-resourced. It's also important to acknowledge that that is by no way unique. With the exception of between 20 to 100 organizations in the United States, 
almost everyone sucks at major IT projects. Um, the difference is, you know, even a medium-sized public traded company will make so many mistakes when rolling out IT. And we all have fun horror stories that we like to trade at hacker conferences about this. The difference is they all have a spreadsheet. And when the net present value of a IT initiative goes below zero, then you say, that's it, start over. And government can't do that. And as we start to think about how we're going to make this, we need to understand just, and this is a very big high level issue, what does experimentation look like for a government agency that allows people to make the occasional small mistake in exchange for getting these rewards? Otherwise, you're simply not going to be able to manage these large IT projects if everyone is sort of very, very careful to never deviate from anything. I just want to jump with uh, what Alan said there, um, because it's something that I tried very hard to push in the government and now hopefully be a part of it on the private sector side, but is um, IT modernization and security modernization as a part of that is um, uh, on the resourcing issue. Um, there's There have been some really good attempts and some legislation around like the tech modernization fund and, and other sort of initiatives to, to really try to tackle this. But um, it's a pretty large scale problem for the government. The level of tech debt that they are trying to sustain um, is, um, is, is very significant. And it's not just a, um, a security issue. You can also think of it as a taxpayer issue, right? There's, there's a lot of money that's going to continually fund the operations and maintenance of outdated systems. And, and so as much as possible, which is what part of the executive order that I really like is thinking about how do we modernize our approach to security and modernize our approach to IT overall. And I'm, and I'm being distinct about IT here um, because I think operational technology is a completely different level of um, investment and, and concern. But um, thinking about, you know, when, when it comes to, for example, the, um, the cloud, right? You can have agencies that can move from um, significant capital expenditures, significant operations and maintenance and lower security, frankly, then if they were to move to the cloud, take advantage of architectures that have been built and tested um, over, at a global scale for many of the, the big companies for some time, um, inherit that level of security at, at honestly a lower cost, um, both you know, um, actual cost and, and as well as um, resource costs in terms of people. Now it's a different sort of risk profile that they need to consider because it's not as if you get to just sort of outsource all your risk, I'm done, oh, this is so easy now. Um, so agencies need to, to think about what does it mean now that I have this partner that's delivering my infrastructure or my software for me and how do I get that level of um, transparency and assurance that what's happening sort of under, under the covers, if you will, is, is what I want to have happen. But it's really then just a measure, it's about doing that assurance work versus having to do it all yourself and then continually every year having to go back to Congress and ask for more money to update that legacy infrastructure or, um, or, or buy a new sort of set of software or pay another set of on-site developers. And, and so I think it's, it's really, we've, I know we've been talking about different aspects, but the, the notion of um, IT and security modernization are really, really tightly linked um, and, and we need to continue to push that in the government, not just the government, a lot of agencies are, are, are not agencies, a lot of organizations, companies sort of globally are dealing with this, but, um, but really being able to think differently and saying, what can I outsource here? And then what does that, what does that mean for my own risk posture and, and how do I, how do I manage that? I want to go back to Camille, you mentioned some of the challenges with defining critical software and we will get to Q&A in a little bit, but I, we did have a question from Mary and Backish about how should the government decide what's most critical software. So I'm wondering if anyone wants to weigh in, you know, what criteria should we be looking at? Is there any sort of precedent for how we can um, make these decisions? Camille, do you have any thoughts? <laughs> go ahead and start, Jeanette, and I'll jump on. Oh, so I will um, I'll go back to something that we did at Homeland Security, um, which was, and it gets to sort of some of the challenges around information sharing and how to prioritize risk, which was to develop a set of nat national critical functions. And the idea that we, that we had 
um, and I believe this continues, was to, to get to that level of detail of what might be a national and critical service that would, um, th that would enable that, that sort of function. Now, this is still at sort of a pretty high level. I don't, I don't know that there's many scenarios where you'd get down to a critical software that would, could be prescribed by the government as supporting those. But I do think it's important, I think it's really important work to say these are the critical functions that our country depends upon and could be degraded or disrupted by an adversary through cyber means. And so let's continue to get to the level of specificity, both for information sharing purposes, do we have the right people looking at the threat? Um, are there vulnerabilities in the, this overall system that could be, um, could be addressed? Um, again, I don't know whether there's many situations where you could get to a specific type of software or a specific brand of software that could, you could get down to that. And I would worry about the government prescribing that. But, um, but, I, but I do think there's been some good work in, in understanding critical functions and services at a high level. Yeah, I think Jeanette captured that really well. If I had to put my speaking for all of industry hat on, um, everyone's afraid that everything will become critical. Everything can't become critical because there's always a tie back to some um, system of import, something that will affect operational readiness, that kind of thing. And so if we get down to being overly prescriptive on each piece of software, we, we run the risk of everything becoming critical, which is one of the reasons why the transparency piece is so important because cross-cutting transparency will facilitate uh, resilience such that we can remediate something that presents itself as a vulnerability a lot easier. There's gonna be a delicate balance with how they think about critical software and how it ties to those functions that Jeanette was talking about. I mean, as we look at some of the other um, area, let's look at CFIUS and how the portfolio there has expanded so much that something like, um, oh, what's that dating app that got rolled back? Got, you know, the, the Grindr. purchase from Grinder. <laughs> the purchase from Grinder got rolled back. Who would have envisioned that that would fall under the definition of foreign investment that would be problematic and, and linked to national security? Um, but as technology evolves and these things integrate into our lives in different ways, having a definition of critical software that is too expansive could be really problematic. So um, I, I love Jeanette's recommendations, but those are some of the things we have to think about. Um, switching from Grindr to uh, operational technology, um, Bryson, we've talked a lot about IT here. What out of this executive order is going to make the biggest impact for companies worried about OT or for whom that is probably going to be the, the bigger challenge? Uh, yeah, what's well, quite a transition. Um, I mean, uh, I guess if I'm trying to figure out how to make that, we're going to go with that ICS is about cyber physical systems. That'll be, that'll be my, my bridge there. Uh, so I don't think the executive order is going to do much of anything on that front. Um, I mean, we can all hope, but when we're sitting here and talking about the challenges we just see on the IT side, I mean, uh, let's throw in IoT. Um, I, I see this in private industry. Um, yeah, we know that's a problem. Can't get to it, don't have enough. Um, so IoT, I think IoT and OT are going to continue to be out there huddling in the cold um, waiting for some other moment. Uh, I think what made this pass, of course, is that the last seven months, we haven't had a day go by, it seems, where some large compromise hasn't happened. Uh, and I think this is where we, the perimeter is dead. I think I can get everybody here to nod their head and say, yes, the perimeter is dead. And yet how much money are we still spending where that's not actually the primary concept? Um, I talk to CISOs all the time who are like, oh, yeah, yeah. But I'm really worried about like vulnerabilities in attack surface. That's the perimeter. And so uh, getting to one of the comments that came in the chat here of let's get out of admiring the problem to like, what exactly do I think needs to happen? So of course, the reason that we as panelists do this so often is because if it were easy, I think it would have already been done. I mean, it's not like we are the, the brain trust that has the answers to everything. Um, but the reason I mentioned the perimeter is dead is because your surface area is not just your assets. Your surface area is everybody that's connected to you, whether that's contractors and people, whether that's their code, whether that's their assets. And the U.S. government for too long ignored this problem 
And the closest that we've had that brought any rigor to it was CMMC. We all see where CMMC has got, not very far in a few years. And that is exactly, to me, the kind of thing that we need in this. Um, the government needs to be taking its supply chain seriously beyond Allen having a technical fragment with SBOM. It's a bigger problem with that data being all these other places. Um, I am always scared whenever I see people going to the cloud as the security solution. And again, another one of those shibboleths is that a lot of folks really do kind of will say one thing and then they really are hoping that, you know, the great and mighty Google, when they take all of my data on their computers, will just solve the problem for me and I'm, I'm good. Uh, and in this case, I think there's a slight grain of truth to that because I think it's that bad. And so my second point is I think them throwing everything to the cloud as much as possible is going to consolidate enough access in a way that they were never able to do before that there's going to be a benefit just because it's so out of control and so sprawling. The third is, again, uh, we need tools to do this. And I think the biggest tool is going to have to be asset identification. You cannot give somebody a configuration management database. That is just not possible because it's the process around it, along with the unique fields for the database to maintain that. But the ability to identify and populate that at least would get us um, pretty far. So me like trying to get us out of panel talking in the cloud world, no pun intended, to three things that I think we can really anchor on. Noting that again, OT and IoT, not no, no one's going to do anything on them anytime soon with this. Since we're on the question, anyone else? Um, so the original question, can the panel identify three actionable items that industry and government can work on going forward that will make a difference? Anyone else have any prescriptions to offer? I'll just add another one. We've been working through an end-to-end -end framework on supply chain um, levels for software artifacts. It's focused on consensus around standards, um, accreditation, and technical controls that allow for um, identification of non-compliance. And I think that's an area where private sector and the government can continue to work together to build out that framework. And push adoption across industry or leverage this and build off of it such that we have a framework that promotes um, this kind of non-unilateral changes in, in software and accountability and accreditation like Jeanette was talking about earlier. Um, I think it's an option and it's an actionable one that where the, the work has begun. It's not complete, so it's still ripe for collaboration. Um, and it's actually out in the world now for folks to jump in and build off of. And I will just say in the interest of public-private partnerships, uh, love the Salsa framework. Um, think that it still has a little ways to go. It was announced a few weeks ago. The first detailed blog was two days ago, three days ago. Um, yeah. It's great. Uh, however, I think it's it's the challenge is if we're going to be relying on it, we need to do a couple things. So first, um, scope it. Uh, right. So, for example, most of the standards that are built on are not just cloud focused, they are cloud only. So in toto is fundamentally useless if you don't have a modern CI CD pipeline. And I would even have to say, and I love the in toto team, I think they're brilliant. Um, but there are very few organizations today that could use in toto uh, at C. And it's, it's, a, it's a way of documenting the metadata um, from our supply chain to sort of tackle these sort of more sophisticated attacks. Um, so we sort of need to, we, 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 we should be filling our pipeline of what's researched in Toto went from a great research project um, to sort of, hey, a couple of elite companies can, can manage it and to sort of saying, how do we build this into tools that can be commercial off the shelf and then make sure that we can slot it in. So I think that's, that's one key approach for this. The other area, and Dan, I, I don't have, the, the answers I have for you are sort of, hey, let's focus on things like coordinated vulnerability disclosure or field upgradability of IoT or SBOM, which just happen to be the last three things that uh, NTIA has been working on. Uh, but the, 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 the running theme through that has been cost of measurement. Uh, and if we're trying to start someplace where we actually can move things fast, um, I think if you start from working backwards, which is to say, ultimately this is, if it's going to be a government requirement, it's going to be compliance-based. Compliance has a terrible reputation among the cool kids in security because we see it as the opposite of 
a risk-based approach. But on the other hand, that's what the vast majority of organizations on the planet do for security because they need to know when they're done, right? Their job isn't to make secure, their job is to make stuff. And we really, really hope it's secure. And so start with how, what does compliance look like and then work backwards to what's the best combination of not just efficacy demonstrating that it's secure, but showing that I can do it as cheaply and easily as possible. Uh, and that's where getting some of the things like the levels of assurance and salsa can, can really help us. We have some questions rolling in. So we will start Q and A after this question. Um, but so one thing I wanted to ask is last week, Senator Mark Warner began circulating draft legislation for incident notification from critical industries, 24 hours, you got to notify DHS. Is this something that Congress should be pushing? What is sort of Congress's role in working alongside this executive order to make sure that the federal government has the cybersecurity it needs? Jeanette, I was deferring to you. I have spicy opinions. Let's start with the spicy opinions since we just talked about salsa. <laughs> Uh, so going to what I said earlier, uh, yeah, thanks. See, I'm just segueing all of the metaphors. That one I did by accident. <laughs> uh, so what I was saying earlier, um, building on that, um, the great soft underbelly of the United States is private sector. We are the number one economy in the world. That economy is driven by those businesses that rely on information technology to scale and compete as a modern business in a global environment. Great. What does that mean? Target, 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 target. That's why they're that's why they're going for it. All right, and at the same time, we've computerized all of our critical infrastructure. Target, 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 target. Right, um, and then at the same time, we have this balance of again, we don't share information. And to be fair, one, the U.S. government created this position. They strategically was like private sector for the longest time. You're on your own. Um, I mean, Colonial contacted the FBI and the FBI was like, yeah, like, you know, cause it was down at the local office and they're like, yeah, you don't, you know, you don't have to really tell CISA. Um, we, you know, whatever. And they, Colonial assumed they were telling them. And then we've had cases where private industry has been burned, where they have gone and talked to government and government has leaked the information. Those kinds of things are hard to come back from. Um, this is, this was the reason I agreed to come and be an advisor to CISA last year with Jeanette and Chris Krebs is because I believed that there was going to be a reset out of DHS to extend that olive branch and really genuinely see it through where that level of conversation could start again. Um, I don't quite know where we're at on the temperature of that with, with industry and government, but I do know it needs to change. And I think that government just mandating it uh, there needs to be a lot more to it than that. I think it's a good idea. I'm for the transparency. I'm highly skeptical of because of the past. So glad Bryson went first because I think I can sort of maybe sort of on the on the other side of it when you when you started with um, talking about private sector being the sort of soft underbelly. Um, I think there's I, I agree with you on some elements of the private sector. Um, I would also, I, I don't know that it's fair to put that all in the private sector because there are government entities that probably constitute that sort of um, target rich environment as well. Um, but what I would also say is that the private sector can also be our biggest asset. And so, and, and frankly, one of the reasons that I, that I joined Google, um, because if you, if you think about what's happening sort of at a, at a very high level sort of strategically over the years, we have strategic competitors who've been identifying ways to engage with us asymmetrically, right? And so um, we have those who, who found those asymmetric opportunities through abroad, which I'll just call cyber as a very broad sort of term, which um, I challenge anybody to define in any meaningful way. But we will just say in you know, sort of this, this broad digital ecosystem, we have these strategic competitors that have um, identified ways to, um, to hold us at risk as um, in, in many different ways or, or even and and equally challenging, frankly, whether they do it or whether it's just a perception um, that they've they've done it are, are also um, part of this. So 
if you think about it then is how have we tried to combat that um, information sharing um, and you know some of these other sort of capabilities and a lot of other work that the government's done but um, I, I think that um, there's, there's a lot more that could be done to think about how can you counter that asymmetric imbalance with, um, with scale and with speed and with depth of capability. A lot of that is through a very, very deep trusted partnership with, um, with, with government and those private sector entities that have that, that scale and that depth. Um, and frankly, it's not just a US thing. It's got to be something that's broader and with you know, like-minded countries and, and all of that. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there as, as, as food for thought in, in thinking about and, and also tying together we're talking about with modernization is the private sector can both provide um, more capabilities more securely at lesser cost, though you still have to know how your own risk profile, you cannot outsource that risk. So I just wanna keep saying that, um, but also by, do, by, by thinking about um, sort of key elements of the private sector as, as an, um, an enabler for the um, for global community to be able to continue to provide a more secure and safe internet overall, I, I think is, is really important and not to lose that as we get into some of the details. So um, I, on, the, on the specific question on the, the Warner legislation and, and sort of notification of, um, of, of government, I think, you know, we spent a lot of time figure, trying to think through when I was in the government of what are the challenges with, um, you know, why, why do we still kind of, we keep talking about it, but why do we still have this mismatch um, between what the government um, thinks they need and what the private sector is willing to give. And um, there's, it's, it's a very multi-sided sort of conversation, but for me, it, what I started to realize is we were lumping a lot of things in a broad umbrella. And, and to, to really get down to specifics of, I need this information, this type of information in this time frame in order to stop X from happening. And, to, and it gets back to that national critical functions conversation is like, if we're trying to protect our elections and we are trying to protect our electric grid, there is a group of people that have useful information in a timely manner to be able to, um, to prevent things or to be able to respond. And so that's where we're really trying to drive at DHS. And I, and I believe they're still going this direction is to get to that level of specificity City. And so there's not sort of just a general, okay, private sector, just tell us when bad things happen, because it's, it's hard to parse that out um, from, a, from a private sector perspective and, and what use that would be for, um, for us and for the government. Just a small addition there, that level of granularity facilitates the trust that traditionally hasn't been there, which is stymied the information sharing and collaboration. And so I think that's a great way to facilitate that. And I actually hope that the um, Cyber Safety Board and the opportunity for private sector companies to actually be a part of the who, what, where, how, and then receive some information in kind after that kind of review of a cyber, a significant cyber incident will help facilitate that trust as well. We have a few questions from our audience. Um, so with our last 10 minutes, I'll get to those. Um, first is a follow-up question in response to the NIST request for comment. Some have said critical software, which will be prioritized under the order. Some in the industry have said this should be narrowly limited to devices, things, and others say it should include the supporting third parties, such as cloud providers. Should cloud providers be considered critical software? No. Next question. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I think one. Um, I, I think naming a cloud. There's just a lot of software involved <laughs> in providing cloud services. So that's sort of problem A. Um, and um, and so it would be to to me. It's more about defining what what you believe is critical. Um, for your software to provide um, and what is um, from a risk perspective, what types of software functions are, um, would you consider critical? But I think kind of designating cloud overall as critical software um, it probably wouldn't 
it, it wouldn't jive with the intent as I understand sort of the current conversation. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't continue talking about cloud's role in providing key services, um, particularly as more and more um, organizations move to the cloud and provide more and more significant services on the cloud. Um, so if that makes sense to, to just sort of parse the difference between a critical software versus um, a service or a function that we want to make sure is highly resilient. As somebody who has no say in the cloud, I agree. The software itself, out of scope, the infrastructure itself would be critical, particularly since that is going to be essentially the, the hosting asset. All right, our next question here, and I think this is for Alan. What are the next steps on NTIA's request for public comment on SBOM? Uh, very briefly, so for software bill of materials, NTIA's uh, role was first for the EO was to coordinate the broader stakeholder community. We had experts from around the world, from a whole bunch of different sectors, uh, participate to sort of let's advance this, let's talk about how we can uh, dovetail and, and have SBOM complement all this other work that's happening. That's still going on and will continue. Uh, NDI's requirement is to define the minimum elements of SBOM. Uh, we will be posting some of the comments we received. We received about 70, 80 comments. Um, we'll be posting those as soon as we can so that everyone else can look at them. Uh, the, um, and by July 11th, we are uh, going to be having a public document that defines the minimum elements of SBOM uh, and um, sort of lays out as well sort of a, a path to the future of how do we go from minimum elements to, to sort of expanding it. Um, and then it'll be uh, other parts of the government will picking it up, picking that up and working with uh, NTIA uh, to think about what that looks like from a federal procurement rules perspective. Um, and NTIA will continue to uh, shepherd the stakeholder community to focus on implementation and scale. Our next question, um, I'm going to paraphrase this a little bit, but a big focus of the executive order is getting the government's house in order to lead on this issue. I thought the best policy statement in the executive order was one of the best. I thought the policy statement in the executive order was the best part. Should we stop getting mad at companies like Colonial when they don't immediately share info with CISA during their disaster recovery? until we don't live in a glass house. What is the proper balance for the government when it comes to these attacks on critical infrastructure other than trying to deter them to begin with? So I think this gets a little bit back to those questions of transparency um, and information sharing. Does anyone have any other comments on that? I mean, it's a little bit out of scope of the executive order question, but I, I think we are, cyber is not about cyber. Right. There are lots of levers at play on the geopolitical stage that are in scope and the U.S. government beyond this executive order needs to be looking at how do we change the economic utility and the calculus of actors, whether that is a country level actor or whether that is more what we'll call a criminal level actor uh, so that they decide to think twice before they push that enter button. We have another question here, um, a little bit outside of the executive order, but this might go to critical industries and how we think about some of these issues. Uh, what are the biggest cybersecurity issues facing institutions of higher education and how can they be addressed? Um, any connection there to what we're seeing now? Obviously we didn't hit on ransomware at all, but uh, any thoughts on how these things relate? I mean, I guess I can take a stab. Um, you know, I say I would think that in addition to to ransomware and just sort of um, cyber incidents that make a business or an institution unable to deliver, um, I think some of the biggest challenges that higher um, education institutions deal with is they have a very sort of natural default to open. Um, and it, everything is, is very open and research. And, um, and this isn't necessarily a quote cyber issue exactly, but you know, we have seen um, over time where some of that, where it is 
is exploited and some of that um, development of intellectual property is lost um, because there was an openness within it within a community and the idea that there was this fortress protecting us in the form of that perimeter um, but um, the, but that information was was lost um, and then I think the last thing would be um, uh, students and other um, PII um, personally identifiable identifiable information and particularly a lot of financial data tied up with their um, financial aid applications is something to um, for for those people who work in academic institutions to to consider because those can be a target I thought that Jeanette was going to say that students were one of the cybersecurity risks and that's true right that's a lot of where great hacking and security skills from those people pushing the limits. The last thing I'll say is just going back to, to Bryson's point, I think higher ed has a terrible time with asset management. I promise you there's an R1 university with a PDP 11 in the server room that says do not unplug that people actually follow. Uh, and so I think that's where, um, right, just, we need to have better tools that can handle the kind of diversity that you see in a research university. And by diversity, we mean a bunch of students that are pretty much downloading everything that they can possibly imagine and from questionable places. And running it to see what happens. We have two minutes left. Um, we have not talked about the national cyber director role yet. I know some of you were brought this up in our, our pre-panel conversation. Chris Inglis confirmed last week, we're still waiting on a CISA director, but now we have this role that's supposed to be the glue to kind of tie all these agency efforts together and give us maybe a, a coordinated front on these issues. Any advice for Chris? You talked a lot about breaking down the silos between agencies during the confirmation hearing. I think, you know, focusing a lot on that to help facilitate a lot of what we talked about in the, the CEO discussion is really important as well as his ability as an individual, but also in that role to help facilitate that public-private partnership and those trust relationships that we've been talking about this entire conversation. I think Chris and his relationships to Anne and to Jen when she gets confirmed um, are going to be really helpful in articulating what the National Cyber Director Office does moving forward and the role it plays and I think there needs to be a big push in redefining and cementing what each of those leaders owns um, and how they'll work together to drive forward this very ambitious and timely set of objectives. I would just add one thing. Um, first of all, I think it's great. I think he's gonna do a great job. My one piece of advice would be to prioritize ruthlessly. Um, getting um, bogged down in interagency um, conflicts and challenges, it, 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 um, it can be significant. And so really focusing on those areas that um, can have a, a tremendous scalable impact and removing those barriers between information sharing among agencies and, and making sure that everybody's sort of prioritizing the, the same, same set of work. Um, I know that sounds a little bit mundane, but um, it's, I, I think it could be the single biggest um, key to success. And the relevance uh, will be first tested in the next crisis we have that changes and suddenly IoT is the biggest thing, right? And everybody forgets about this. Um, I know that that was a, certainly a challenge that we've, we've seen at other agencies in the past. Well, I'm sure there are many more conversations to have as this executive order goes forward and we see more from the administration. Fortunately, we're out of time for today. Thank you to all our panelists for this great conversation and thank you to our audience for attending. <laughs>